Welcome back. We're going to uh, continue on now and talk a little bit more about inflammation and fever. All right, inflammation can also be called uh, or is a result of the inflammatory response. And there are several key signs of acute inflammation. By the way, the term acute refers to usually short in duration and intense and that term is as opposed to chronic which is usually slower to develop longer lasting and not as intense and you know, we just saw those terms with leukemia you can have acute leukemia versus chronic leukemia and so it's being used in a similar way with inflammation acute or chronic or versus chronic would be a better way to do that. Uh, so some key signs of inflammation include redness, heat, swelling of tissues, pain, and sometimes impairment of function if you have enough swelling and pain going on, um, or scar tissue development. The development of scar tissue is something that follows inflammation uh, after a injury or a burn. And uh, so we'll return to these key signs in a few moments and talk about why they Develop. So the next few slides uh, come from figure 21.4 in your textbook and so they're just showing you the different steps of inflammation. And so this poor person that we see here has been stabbed with a nail <laughs> or attack. It looks like a nail to me. Has penetrated the skin so it's gone through the epidermis and we're down here in the dermis. And now we all have bacteria all over our skin all the time. And so when something like this penetrates the surface of your skin, it's going to drag skin bacteria down in here into the dermis. And the dermis is supposed to be sterile. So you don't want to have, you're not supposed to have microbes, microorganisms down in that part of the skin. Also, our, our nasty nail up there may have had microorganisms over it when it penetrated the skin and those get uh, dragged down into these tissues. All right, so when this happens, the inflammation process gets triggered and um, you always you have cells stationed in your connective tissues called mast cells and mast cells are able to detect injury they detect uh, bacteria and other microorganisms that have invaded a tissue where they're not supposed to be and then they send out signals which trigger vasodilation okay so your local uh, blood vessels dilate and the blood vessels become leakier so the little clefts or the little slits between the individual cells and the walls of the blood vessels that you see there uh, they become wider and your um, white blood cells that are present in your blood are able to leak out of those or move out of those blood vessels more easily and out comes the fluids more plasma leaks into the tissues as well um, and that begins the process of begins the process of uh, inflammation alright so what they're showing you here in this diagram are some neutrophils in the blood that are squeezing through the walls of a capillary here and are getting into this tissue where these bacteria are located. Now this first phase over here, leukocytosis, that's a leukocytosis means you have an increased number of white blood cells. And so they're uh, they're gonna because you have increased blood flow to this area, you're gonna have an increased number of all blood cells. Um, moving into this particular tissue where we have inflammation going on. This step margination that they're showing you here, um, there are signals that are sent to the capillaries that cause neutrophils and other white blood cells to put on the brakes. That's margination. They actually stick to the walls of the capillaries and this is letting them know, hey, here's where you need to exit. Here's where we have inflammation going on. And so those cells will 
start clinging and moving their way out. Diapedesis that you see here is the name that refers to neutrophils and other white blood cells squeezing through the walls of the capillaries and moving into the tissues where we have inflammation going in place. Chemotaxis is a term which refers to uh, kind of like following a trail of breadcrumbs, except in this case our bread breadcrumbs are, are chemicals. So your damaged cells and tissues, your mast cells that are always stationed in these tissues, um, and chemicals being given off by bacteria or other types of microorganisms that may be in this injured tissue, uh, those are chemical signals that attract neutrophils and other types of white blood cells to the location where this is happening. So that's how your neutrophils here are actually finding these bacteria. They undergo chemotaxis, kind of like where they follow a chemical trail of breadcrumbs. All right, so those things are happening as part of your inflammation process. Let me, I'm going to try to move back over here for a second to the key signs of acute inflammation. All right, so why are we having redness? So when inflammation got stimulated, why do we see redness if this is happening at the surface of the skin or along a mucous membrane lining? The redness that you see is due to vasodilation. Those superficial blood vessels have dilated to increase the blood flow to the area and uh, that's actually visible on the surface of the skin if you have a lighter skin tone as redness. Heat, you know, why do you, why do, why does the skin around an inflamed area feel warm to the touch? Again, that's just due to the increased blood flow. You're bringing that warm blood from uh, down deeper in the body up near the surface, so it's going to feel warmer at that location. Swelling, that is coming from more plasma. You have an increase in plasma. Is getting filtered out of the capillaries. And into the tissues where inflammation is taking place. Pain. Um, injured tissues, injured cells secrete chemicals that stimulate uh, sensory neurons. So you have sensory nerve endings in tissues that respond to chemical signals from injured cells um, or molecules from microorganisms that have entered a tissue as well. Um, and also just the general swelling, the increased fluid in those tissues is going to um, irritate those nerve endings and then they're going to send uh, action potentials to the spinal cord and then you're going to have signaling that goes to the brain and you're going to perceive that as pain. And then finally impairment of function. If your tissues are swollen enough and painful enough, you're not going to be able to use them as well as you originally could. And a final aspect of inflammation as well is healing and repair of your tissues. And, um, you know, after that happens, if you have a severe enough injury, your original tissues may wind up being replaced with scar tissue, which is connective tissue that often has uh, an inappropriate concentration or composition of fibers in it, collagen and elastin, elastic fibers. And the tissue may not have its proper consistency or elasticity. Um, and that's what we call scar tissue. So sometimes if you have a really severe burn or injury, you may have so much scar tissue that's generated that you lose, uh, lose function of that particular part of the body. Or, uh, like with the heart, cardiac muscle does not get replaced. So if your cardiac muscle cells die due to a myocardial infarction, it um, gets replaced with scar tissue, and now you've got a chunk of your myocardium that's no longer functional because it's been replaced with scar tissue. All right, what about fever? Fever is another important process of our innate immune system. And this is a deliberate, systemic, across the whole body response. 
to um, invading microbes. It actually gets triggered by white blood cells and macrophages in your tissues that have detected foreign substances, especially microorganisms, and then they secrete pyrogens. These are chemicals that trigger fever. What's a pyrogen? You know, like a pyromaniac refers to heat. Pyrogens are chemical signals. Guess where they act on? You know, what are the targets of these pyrogens going to be? Where is your body's thermostat? Hopefully you remember that is in the hypothalamus portion of the brain. There are neurons in the hypothalamus that receive these pyrogen signals and um, then uh, they produce their own signals that stimulate other neurons in the hypothalamus to change the body's thermostat. So instead of having 98.6 Fahrenheit as our normal homeostatic set point for temperature, it's dialed upward. All right, so fever is beneficial if it's in a moderate state. And um, some of the benefits are not completely accepted or well understood yet. But uh, it has been noted that a mild fever causes your liver and spleen to sequester iron and zinc. So they manufacture proteins that actually soak up extra iron and zinc. And microorganisms, just like we need iron and zinc, zinc, you know, why do you need zinc? Zinc is a um, helps out some of your enzymes so that they can do perform chemical reactions. That's why you need it. So, and microbes need these as well. So the idea there is if your liver and spleen are producing proteins that bind excess iron and zinc and hide it from the microbes, it's going to make it more difficult for microorganisms to grow. Um, a mild fever increases your metabolic rate. Chemical reactions tend to happen faster at higher temperatures. They tend to slow down at cooler temperatures. So it's thought that by jacking up your temperature just a little bit, that increases your metabolism and helps uh, speed up the um, phagocytosis process. It's believed to get faster with fever. And it also speeds up some of our repair processes. Now you guys know fevers are beneficial, but you may not realize that a fever is beneficial because we tend to fight them right away. But um, a mild fever, maybe we don't need to do that. A mild fever is considered to be beneficial. And I know you're thinking, yeah, right, I don't care if I feel crappy because I have a fever, I'm going to take some Tylenol. Um, high fevers, though, you know, you start getting up into that 105, 106 range and higher than that. Those become dangerous because your enzymes are sensitive to those higher temperatures. They can denature. If you guys remember what that means, if here's an enzyme, most of your enzymes are proteins. Those are organic molecules that have particular three-dimensional shapes and high temperatures can cause them to unravel. They lose their three-dimensional shape. Uh, when that occurs, they're, they are said to have denatured. If they do that, they can no longer perform their chemical reactions and other jobs that are so important for proteins in the body. And if your enzymes ain't working, you're going to die. That's just the, just the way it is. So um, high fevers can become very dangerous because of that and also because they dehydrate you and that can screw up your uh, uh, water levels and also your electrolyte concentrations within the body and that's bad news for you as well as we know. Okay, next video lecture. So we've kind of had a, um, a, a very skeletal <laughs> overview of the innate immune system and again you'll learn a lot more when you take microbiology. Uh, the next lecture, we're going to have an introduction to the adaptive immune system. This is the branch of your immune system that um, does not respond always immediately. It can take a little bit of a t time for it to generate a response. But once it does, it creates some very powerful weapons against very, very specific microbes. And it also develops memory. It remembers that you have met that microbe before and so the next time you get exposed to the same thing it is going to respond much much more quickly so we'll start talking about that branch of the immune system 
for a lecture number eight.